you know, if we can just, if we can just have our eyes open to see God is everywhere. He is in our midst. God is here. God is listening. God is speaking. God is weighing out our hearts, our minds, our thoughts. He is the almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful, infinite, unlimited, I am. Lord, it's before you that we choose to bow, not only our heads, not only our necks, but we want to and we choose, Lord, to bow our will. And we ask you this morning, Lord, to help us to bow our will before you in the name of Yeshua Moshiach. You are able, Lord, to work in us the brokenness, the humility, your fear that we need so that we can sit before your word and ask your word to speak to us, to speak to me, to speak to each one of us, so that we can hear your living words, so that our whole being can, be, can catch a flame and burn and be glad and happy and dance, so that we can come to the place that we each need to be in you. We thank you, Lord, that we can do nothing. We are completely dependent upon you. Therefore, we ask, Lord, work in us and work through us with your blood. Cover us with your blood. Cleanse us with your blood. Forgive us, Lord. Push away everything that stands between us and you. We pray, Lord God, that you will lay your cross upon us so that we will sit before you, Lord, in surrender and in worship, receiving the bread of life, drinking, Lord, from the fountain of life, sharing and, and enjoying, Lord, the honey, the sweetness of your word, the olive oil, Lord God, to make us fat so that we can have power and energy to serve you. Lord, we pray that the waters will gush forth from your rock so that we can be quenched. We pray in Jesus' name. May your manna fall. May each one of us pick up our portion for this day, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. That's right. Let's turn to Psalm 92. Come on, Psalm 92. Now, of course, there's a lot to say about Psalm 92. Psalm 92 was many times read as a song, as a song on the Sabbath. In Afrikaans sê hulle, dit is opwekken tot een loflied. Just now and now and then I'm going to read from the Living Bible as well. The Living Bible is a paraphrase, it's not a translation. But it gives us a good idea many times of the spirit of, of the song. So now and then I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read from the Living Bible. All right. The Living Bible is not a study Bible, it's a paraphrase. Right. Let's read the first four verses. You can read with me aloud. We're going to, I'm going to read from the King James Bible. So read with me. It will be wonderful if you can read with me. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning 
and thy faithfulness every night upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. And verse 5, O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Right, so let's just go through the, uh, the psalm slowly. I'm, we're going to read the rest of the verses as we continue. Mein uh, Ergefall. Let me read from this, uh, from this Bible, as I said to you, from the Living Bible, I'm going to read. And as I said to you, it's actually to uh, excite you on your op back. To, to thank the Lord and to bless Him. I'm going to read from here. It is, a good, it is good to say thank you to the Lord, to sing praises to the God who is above all gods. Can you say amen? He is the God above all gods. Every morning tell Him, thank you for, my kind, for your kindness. Every evening rejoice in all His faithfulness. Sing His praises accompanied by music, from the harp and lute and lyre. You have done so much for me, O Lord. No wonder I am glad. I sing for joy. Has the Lord done anything good for you? Yes. Okay, so that gives us enough reason to thank Him. O Lord, what miracles you do. And how deep are your thoughts. Amen. Now when, uh, when we... When he talks here about, in verse 4, he says, For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. We're going to have a look at this word works, because we need to know what, what is the works that God is talking here about. Works. Work, the word works, and the word work. Every time the same word is used here to describe his work. If I can read it to you, if I can spell it to you in, in uh, English, it is the word makash, makase. All right, that is the, the English spelling of this word. Uh, let me spell this word to you uh, in Hebrew. Where did I spell it? Here I did. Still in English just for you to, to um, see where the spelling comes from. All right. And then let me write it to you first in ancient Hebrew. M, M, then the Ayin, and then a Samek, and then a Hey, sorry, it's a hey Okay, so let me just write it in Biblical Hebrew to you. Mem, the Ayen, Samek, Samek, in the Hay. That's the word works or work. So that we can see for what we must praise God for. If we look at the components, of what his work, his work or his works is, then we can understand how much we have to thank the Lord for. All right, let's just have a look at the components of what this word works consists of. It consists of a man, okay? When, when I came to him, my heart was in chaos. But his word and his revealed word he reveals himself through his word. Started bringing order 
into my life. That's enough to praise Him for. Each one of us, when we hear the news and we hear the different things going on, it confuses us. But the moment that we turn to the Word and we allow the Word to speak to us, it brings order. Immediately, when we allow that, it touches our eyesight. It gives us new eyesight. It opens our eyes so that we can look at circumstances for what it really is. So therefore, I can thank Him for His wonderful works. His wonderful works is that He brings order in my confusion. He opens my eyes so I can really see what it's about. And what we can add to that is... Uh, the Zion consists out of a Zion and enlarged youth. So what does it say? What does it, what is, uh, what can we say more? What we can say is, our eyes get opened because the Zion, which talks about the truth, no? Zion talks about truth, emet truth, God is sovereign, God is Lord, and as He enlarges His Spirit to us, our, opens, our eyes get open more, because as I am, has got eyes, and the, His Spirit, the youth, has got eyes, so he, can, he opens our eyes more and more. That's His works that I need to thank Him for, because when I start studying the Word of God, and I start returning to the to the to the truth, my eyesight is changed. That is great works, because I remember how I saw things before His truth came to me, and before I opened the truth, and before I listened to His truth, and before His Spirit came, and now that His Spirit has come, and continuously come, and His truth continuously come to me, I can thank Him for His great works. The say wonderwerke, the say werke wat hy doen. Verder elemente waarom vir ek om kan om, is vir die samek, because if I, if I allow this principles, him to work in my life, it brings a lot of support, security, support in me. What does this samek talk about? If you just look at that simplification of that chart there, can you see it? Tell me. Sticks to you. Supports to you. It supports us. It talks about the shield as well. So, the works of God is because He shields us off. He shields off many things that, that comes to us. Many enemies, many forms of that the enemy comes to us. Even your own thoughts. Even your own desires. Ons eie begeertes. All right, so that is part of his works. What else is part of his works? If we look at the hay, because we allow his word, his revealed word to speak to me, to judge me, to weigh me out, we allow his truth and his spirit to work, work in me, and to work in me that support that his spirit and his word does bring, because of that, he opens up new ways in my life. The hay even talks about repentance. The Jewish rabbis say that the hay is written this way. It hasn't got a solid basis so that when you and I, let me just write there, uh, a little man on his knees. The hay talks about repentance. He says, so that we, there's no limit for us to go down. And the moment we go down in repentance, divine light comes in through the, through the window that you see there. You see the window there? So divine light can enter in. And new windows can open in my life. That's wonderful, is it niet? So daar is klomp goed wat ons die Heere voor kan dank. Dit is wat die woord werken van praat. Als ons dan kan werken, dan denk ons altijd, hoe die Heere vir my geld voorzien het. Hoe die Heere vir my uh, gehelp het hierdie maand om dier my finansies te kom. Uh, hoe die Heere my gehelp het toe ek siek was, of my geliefde ges, uh, beskerm het in iets. Dis deel van sy werke, ja, 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 ja. Maar is baie, 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 baie meer as dit. 
Dit sluit al hier die dinge in. Waar hy ons oor oopmaak, waar hy orde en chaos gebring het, waar hy ons sekerheid en standvastigheid gegee het, waar hy ons geleer het om te repent, en ons af te gaan, waar hy nieuwe, vir ons nieuwe godelike licht gebring het, so dat ons uh, uh, beter kan sien, beter kan verstaan. Dit sluit, uh, word alles ingesluit by die woord werke. Dis die werke. Hy sê, O oh Lord, how great are thy works. So that is the works of God. In the general church world, the works of God is miracles and all the things that you can see on the outside, mostly, they, uh, that is miracles. That is works. No, it's not that way. It is got it, it must have the, it does have the components and the elements and the works of God in this, in that way. And this word, how would you pronounce that? Mash. I always said makashe. Okay. It even talks about tapestry. It actually gives you the the idea of a tapestry. Now, how does a tapestry work? You know a tapestry, you ladies know a tapestry works this way. My, my wife has done some tapestries. You've got the screen. So now, yes, I'll be able to describe this act. Got a screen, and you've got a picture in mind, and you do a stitch here with a certain color, and then you do a stitch there with a certain color. And then you do a stitch here with a certain color. And I would come to her when she does tapestry, I said, where are you going? Why do you do there and there and there? Why don't you start at a certain point and follow a certain pattern and a certain order? But she doesn't work that way. Somebody that does tapestry doesn't work that way. Because they've got the picture and the end result in their mind. That is what God has. He's got a picture, a picture in his mind of your life. And, he, and you know, it, you, you work, when you work with, tap, uh, with tapestry, you take a needle. It annulled that, that, that prick. A needle. And every time you, you pinch, is that the right word? Prick. You prick with a needle, you take it through, and you make a knot, or whatever, or you make a next stitch. And every time that goes into the material, that stitch, it hurts. And God is doing that with you and me. Every time He pinches you, or pricks you, you say, why? Because you, you're too close to the pattern, too close to the stitches to see the pattern. But God knows the pattern. And He works on our lives here, and through that circumstance, and through that person, and through the dog, and through the weather, and through this person, that family member, and that person that uh, opposes you, and the taxi in the traffic, and all of that, because he's got, one, he's got a picture in mind, he wants to, uh, eventually when he's finished, the image of his son must be tapestried, I don't know if you get that word, in our lives. That is what this word means. Works. Yes, if you look at what God is doing in your life, Shanae say, he say, waarmee is die Heere bezig? Het hy een plan met my leven? Het hy een plan met ons leven? Is hy op pad ergens in? Want waarschijnlijk is, is hy op pad nergens nie. Want is hoe dit vir ons voel, as die Heere met ons bezig is. Ek sê nie, dit is hoe jy voel nie. Ek sê net, ek praat in die algemeen. Dan dink ons, Heere, waar, my gaan jy, nou is jy bezig met een rooi garing, nou is jy bezig met een groen garing, die kleren pas nie by mekaar nie. Maar dan, dan is jy hier bezig met my, dan is jy daar bezig met my. Dit is die werke van die Heere, dit is hoe die Heere werk. Hy het die groot plan. Hy is die persoon, ek weet nie wat noem is iemand wat tapestry doen nie, wat noem jy die persoon wat het doen? In your country, you do, you do uh, 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 carpets. You do carpets. The person that starts with the carpet has got an image in his mind or her mind. 
And you cannot stop them and say, look, you're confused because then you work here, then you work there, then you work there, then you work there on the carpet. But after the carpet has been finished, there's a perfect image. This is the Lord with us work. So, yeah, we have the faith om die Heere te loof en te prijs, wanneer ons, na sy werke kyk in ons levens, steekie, versteek, versteek, dan werk hy hier, dan werk hy daar, dan werk hy hier, dan werk hy hier, dan werk hy daar, dan werk hy met die gans, op die, op die dam plaasdam, dan los hy die gans op die plaasdam, net so halfpad uitge, uitgewerk, dan werk hy weer hier met die padde op die klip, en dan werk hy met die huis, die ouwe vervallen uh, plaashuis. En so werk die Heere, met ons. Is that right? Is that how you experience it? So here he says, because he realizes what the works of God is. He says, O oh Lord, how great is thy works. En kan u dit een geloof begin sê, Madeleine, hoe wonderlijk is die Heere se werke, by die werk, in jou leven. Dis geloof nodig om dit te sê. Hoe wonderlijk is die werke, Heere? Ek kan nie die plan achterkom nie, ek kan nie die prentjie sê nie, maar ek weet, is bezig om die karakter in my leven te werk. Hoe groot is die werke, Heere? He says, thy thoughts are very deep. Now when God works the tapestry of his son out, when he works it out in your life, we can all say, your thoughts are very deep. Because I cannot see a plan. I cannot see where you're heading. But I know your thoughts are very deep. Maar alleen die Heer is die gedagtes vir jou. As ons specifiek nou net, sê maar nou denk aan die werk. Ons kan nou enige plek denk, maar kom ons denk aan die werk. Sê gedagtes vir jou by die werk is baie diep. En die werke wat hy doen in jou leven daar, is baie diep. Daarom maak het baie keer seer, want hy gebruik een naald en garing. Hy gebruik nie een kwasie en sy om het te doen nie. Hy gebruik een naald en garing. Alright. Isaiah 55 verse 8, you can no need to turn there, but there the word says, his thoughts are not, are not our thoughts. So where, where uh, when the psalm writer says here, Thy thoughts are very deep. He says it by faith and he knows God's thoughts are deep. And that word thought, that word thought for the word thoughts is the word koshab in the Hebrew. And that means your ideas, God's ideas for your life is much deeper than your, the ideas that you have for your life. It also means fabricate. I didn't write the spelling of that word, I should have, but uh, if you know how much words I did write down, uh, we would be spelling long time. All right, but this is just the English spelling. We can, I can afterwards find you the Hebrew spelling, no problem. Uh, no, tell me. Your surname. Really? Fantastic, huh? And it's scary. The, yes, it's scary. What? I'm freaking out today. <laughs> <laughs> there are what? actually six of us here now. Me and me, Charlay, Michelle, Saffron, and Sapphire. Yeah. And did you know what the meaning is? No. The only thing I know is that in poetry, they would, um, they would, when they use simile or metaphor for very, um, very valuable jewelry, yes. they would, they would, Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I forgot about that. Thank you very much. So it means weaver. It means the idea. It means fabricate. Fabricate. 
All right. And it means much more, of course. Uh, it also means afflictions. It means improvise. So, he says, thy thoughts are very deep. He says, God, you know, what you have fabricated, what you have thought out for my life, is very deep. I cannot understand it. It's very deep. It is part of your works. And by faith I say, how great is your works? How great is, our, is his works, his thoughts? The pathway that he has taken you, far greater than we can understand, because his thoughts, the Bible says, is higher than our thoughts. Much higher. Now I'll go, and, I'll go and have a look at the Hebrew spelling and I'll give it to you. Remind me, please help me. Uh, right. Uh, now when he says his thoughts are deep, let me just write to you that word deep, how the word deep is spelled. It's the word omak. And we've heard about the omak valley. Ooh. Omak. And let me, write, let me spell the word omak to you. Let's start with the first ancient Hebrew. Uh, ayen. Mem. And then the kof. All right. The ayen, the mem, and the kof. So he says, his thoughts are very deep. What do we say about his thoughts is very deep? I don't know what the Afrikaans Bible says. Is one of you the Afrikaans Bible? So now what say you there? You use the word deep. This is very um, deep is your thoughts. Now it's also deep. What do we do with deep? By deep is this what we do. The Omak Valley. The Bible talks a lot about the Omak Valley, the Chai Valley, and so on. The Omak Valley, the Omak Valley is uh, talking about the Zayen, the truth, with the, with the youth, the Spirit of God, that opens our eyes. So he says, it is so deep, deep enough, or, yeah, deep enough to open our eyes, and to open more, and more, and more, and more eyes in our life. Because we said, when the Bible talks about our sight, but our eyes, you can imagine if that is an eye, it talks about many, 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 many uh, eyes, if we, can, if we can use that word. All right. So the Omak Valley, or the Omak, the depth, has always has to do with the depth of His Word and His Spirit that He wants to take us, the, the depth of the revelation of His truth and who He is and who you and I am in the face of the Word, the living Word, and then... Because, uh, because of that, that separates us. It puts us aside. His thoughts is so deep because he wants to put us aside for himself, for his service alone. And when we say for his service, it doesn't mean ministry. It means where he reveals himself to you more and more and that he reveals himself through us more and more. Amen. Amen. Right. So, in verse 5, when he says, O Lord, how great are thy works. The psalm writer has got all of this insight and he realizes and he says, it is the deep, deep things, the things that we do not understand, the picture that we cannot see where God is uh, picturing his son in our lives. We cannot see the tapestry at the moment, but by faith he exclaims and he exalts him and he says, God, your work is great. Wanneer sê ons dit, wanneer ons in een moeilike situasie is, en nie die prentjie sê nie, ons sê nie die eind prentjie, ons sê nie waar in is God op pad nie, ons sê nie een patroon wat hy bezig om te doen nie, sê ons dan, Heere, jy is so groot, ek het nie een kloe waar jy nie op pad is met my nie, ek weet nie waarom is ek hier nie, Ek weet nie wat ek bezig is om te doen nie. 
Maar wat hij bezig is om te doen met mijn leven niet. Net omdat u niet kan zien wat die patroon is, die betekent niet God heeft niet patroon. That's important. And I struggle with that many times. Because I like, you can ask my wife, I like to look ahead, to see ahead. And many times, God puts me in positions where I cannot see even up till just now. Never mind the end of the day, never mind tomorrow, never mind the day after tomorrow. And that's where my struggle lies and my war lies. Because now I must say, Lord, your works is so great, so deep. I don't have a clue where you're heading with me. Amen. Can you identify with that? Then it, when he talks about these works, he carries on here. He says, Lord, how great are thy works. Thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth, neither, uh, knoweth not, neither does the fool understand this. A British man doesn't understand it. A fool doesn't understand it. And later on he says, the wicked doesn't understand it. The workers of iniquity doesn't understand it. This works of him. Want dan mense al vir jou gesê, jy dien die Heere, maar kijk hoe gaan het nou met jou? Jy het gesê, die Heere het vir jou gesê, moet so, maar kijk hoe gaan het nou? Yes. Fools, British, wicked, Workers of iniquity, will, will, they do not understand that God is working deep things. And that this circumstance that you are in, that doesn't make sense, that God is in control. Let me just read, read to you from verse 6, here from the Living Bible. He says here, O oh Lord, what miracles you do, and how deep are your thoughts. Unthinking people... Do not understand them. Unthinking, because when we do not think according to Zayen and Emet, according to the truth, we are actually not thinking. We are just confused. Unthinking people do not understand them. They do not understand the works. They do not understand that God is working deep things in your life and my life. They do not understand that God's got a plan, but your life may look like chaos. No fool can comprehend this. He says. Uh, now why not? He says there in verse 6. He says, a British man knoweth not. He knoweth not. That would no mean he doesn't have personal experience. He doesn't have personal experience with God. So he cannot really understand. He cannot really understand where God is going and that God has got a plan and that there's, from God's point of view, there is order. Although our life may be seemingly out of order. A British man knoweth not because he doesn't have that, uh, that experience. You know what British mean? It doesn't mean British, it means British, okay? That word British means uh, to consume by fire, to be angry. To be consumed by fire, it means brutal. It means an Afrikaans beesachtig, of onmenselijk, of redeloos, of onbeskof. Verstaan nie dat die Heere bezig is met die... Ons raak betek hier onbeskof met die Heere. En, en, en ons raak beesachtig en onmenselijk, want ons... Verstaan nie waar is die Heere al pad met ons nie, en dan raak ons soos een, soos een bees, redeloos, woedend, kwaad. Ek weet nie, is net ek? Amanda ook, is daar iemand anders wat dit ook ervaar? Ons raak beesachtig, ons raak redeloos, ons raak onmenselijk. Oké, okay. The word fool, when he says there, uh, a fool, what is a fool? A fool is, a fool says, the Bible says, a fool says, is there a God? And when you come in circumstances, do you many times say, is God in this? Is the Heere in, in dit? Dit is dan oonskynlik so boos. So krom en skeef, hierdie situasie wat ek kry, waar ek myself in bevind. Is God in dit? Yes, God is in the midst of that. 
Do we understand it? Does a brutish man or a fool understand it? He says, no, he doesn't understand it. That word wicked, I had a look, uh, let me just tell you, what, uh, that word wicked means morally wrong. That means, it means somebody that breaks the truth, a per, uh, perverter of the truth. And you know, many times doctrine, doctrine that is preached many times, doctrine perverts the truth. We get doctrine that perverts the truth. And that actually makes, makes it wicked. And then they do not understand that God is in control. God is sovereign. God is in the midst of this. And they, they are fighting the devil and they're fighting spirits and they do all of that. There's a time to do that. We'll see in the Bible. But we must first get our minds right and our hearts right and everything set, set, in, set in order before we get there. And the workers of iniquity are those that in their minds and thoughts they bend the truth to, to, to assist them or to agree with them. Those are the workers of iniquity. Right. Uh, they say, the word says here, God says here, when the, uh, a brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this, when the wicked springs as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do, do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. So what happens? What do we see around us? Uh, the, the brutish and the fool and the wicked and the worker of iniquity, what does the Bible say, the, say there? How does their lives look? They flourish. Sorry, that's an F. Flourish. Like grass, we must say. And what else? Spring as the grass, that's right, spring. All right. And that which we, that we have seen in our lives. Yes, it's shallow, that's right. And it's quick. I mean, yesterday, Friday, yesterday, Friday, we had a look at our grass. And we said, oh, we need rain. If rain would come, uh, can come, then immediately the grass, would, the color would change. The rain came Friday a little bit. Yesterday we said, the color has changed already. It flourishes. Grass flourishes quickly. Uh, okay. Uh, where did I write? I write, wrote something down here that I would like. Yeah. The wicked spring as the grass. So, when skeindlik ervaar die godeloose en die dwaas, wat sê maar die Heere is nie in hierdie ding nie, er, uh, when skeindlik ervaar hulle spoor, voorspoed. And prosperity and success, but it's very temporal. It's us that when we say, but God's thoughts are deeper than my thoughts because I cannot see a pattern in this. I cannot see God in the midst of this. But I am going to praise Him and I am going to thank Him because I know He is present and He has a plan. I'm too close to the stitches to see the pattern. And because of that, I'm going to bless Him and thank Him because around me I see people flourish. In our short lives, now we're not old, but in our short lives, we've seen many people flourish like grass, prosper, successful. And now recently, the last few years, we look around us and we say to one another, where's so-and-so? Ah, oh, the grass is already withering. It's just bare sand left. And we say to one another, it's frightening. It's frightening how God works and how things develop. So he says, the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do, do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. 
so ons kynlik lyk dit, die wat die Heere nie dien nie, as of het goed gaan met hulle, het gaan wonderlik, hulle is, is voorspoedig in hulle werk, het gaan fantastisch met hulle huishoudings, hulle hevelike is fantastisch, uh, 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 en, en al die goeders, hulle koop nieuwe huise, nieuwe karre, alles blink, alles gaan goed, alles gaan goed. Maar dit is soos die gras, stuidelik. En baie mense word ver, 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 uh, ver uh, wat is die woord, verblind, Many people are deceived by that. But the psalm writer says that they shall be destroyed forever. Now when God's word says shall, it is definitely so. Then in verse 8, he starts verse 8. Now he was talking about uh, verse 5 about his works. How wonderful is his works? Verse 6, he talks about the people that rebel against him and that doesn't follow him, doesn't, doesn't see him. Then, verse 7, he continues with that. He says they are like grass. Then, he's, verse 8, he says, but, that's an important word. Maar, there's a very important word there. Maar, but, thou Lord art most high forevermore. Amen. For, he says, if we look around us, they flourish, they grow, they get promotions, they are materially blessed, in their marriages seemingly, they are blessed, they're not serving the Lord, they don't see Him, they don't want to see Him, God's ways are too deep for them, they're not interested in that, and, but He says, but, remember, God is forever. Lord, at most I, forever more. So what He says, He says, there's a quite a higher order, a higher order of superiority, of sovereignty, that is present. That in this life that we just talked about, the temporality and the rebellion against Him and the uh, ignorance of Him, which is very, very short-lived and then destroyed forever. But Thou, Lord, art most high forever. For lo, Thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, Thine enemies shall perish, all the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. Now what is important here, and I realized it, even more, as more, uh, more and more I went over this message, I realized it. If I do not realize God's enemies are my enemies, I'm not going to survive. I remember in one of the border camps that I was, in Angola, there was one specific placard that had a great impression on me. The placard said, know your enemy to fight your enemy. Your enemies are God's enemies, and God's enemies are your enemies. And your enemies are my enemies, and my enemies are your enemies, because if, if I do not realize that the things that I struggle, struggle with are actually God's enemies, God is with me. God is for me. I've got an ally in war. And in a great sense, you are my ally in war as well. Because what you are fighting and what I'm fighting is the same enemy. It's selfishness, it's pride, it is uh, ignorance, it is rebellion, it's obstinacy. It's stupidity, it's foolishness. Exactly the things that God, I won't say fight, because God doesn't fight, He, he wins, He's a winner. He doesn't even enter a fight. Yes, they fight Him. And we've all got the same enemies. And they are the enemies of God. He says here in verse 8, But you are perfect, you are in perfect control. When he says you are most high forever, he actually says you are sovereign, you are in perfect control. Even though the enemy flourish, because he's identified the enemy, he said they are brutish, they are uh, wicked, they are the fools, and uh, the workers of iniquity, those are the enemies. Uh, all right, for he says, for, though, for lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, lo, thine enemies shall perish, 
All the workers of iniquity shall be shattered. Or it's not shattered, scattered. Scattered. Right. So, uh, so he, he identifies the enemy. That's very important in any war and in any battle. Identify the enemy. Then he comes and he tells us about our weaponry. Let's read about the weaponry. Here in verse uh, 6, 7, uh, and 9, he identifies the enemy. Verse 10, he speaks about our weaponry. But, once again, another but. says that's the enemy. They flourish, they grow, they, they prosper, they're successful, seemingly very short-lived. He says, but, God is the most high. Then he says, but... The second but, but, verse 10, my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of an unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Now the horn of a unicorn, now that word unicorn, in the English, in the English, I'm just saying in the English, it means a horse with a single horn. Something? That we struck something? Okay. Right? It's fine. You know, uh, unicorn doesn't come from the fairy tales. Much, much further than that. Many, thousands of years before then, when God uh, spoke to um, Enoch and those people. Because the horse talks about faith. In Job, God talks, explains and describes faith like a horse. And a unicorn is a horse with a horn. In the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, this word, uh, unicorn, the word that actually is used there is a wild ox. And who is the wildest ox that we can find? Aleph. He's the wild ox. If we, look at the, if we look at the gospel in the heavens, we see that Taurus, the great wild ox, will come to judge the nations. The ox, the Aleph. So if we look at the Hebrew, it actually says the horn of the wild ox. The unicorn, the wild ox. So he that is sovereign, he that is the center point in the midst and the governing point the centrifugal point, the turning point, the king, the source. He says, uh, uh, the horn, that horn is actually his horn that he wants. Now what is a horn? Horn is something that grows. When you and I get saved, we do, we do not get saved with a horn. The horn grows. A horn must grow. And he talks here about, he says here, uh, for, uh, but my horn, the psalmist says my horn. So each one of us grows our own horn. Your personal horn. In your relationship with him, the horn grows. The more and more you and I acknowledge him, him as Aleph, as the sovereign one in our midst, the horn grows. When we acknowledge him as the sovereign one and the one that is in the midst with you in the circumstances that you are, the horn grows. It is your horn. You need a horn in this battle. And that horn, he says, uh, the horn of a unicorn. That word unicorn, there is the, uh, in Hebrew it says it is the horn of Aleph. Now, if we, and I'm going to tell you more, it, it, that horn means also, in the Hebrew it means the corner of the altar, of the altar. The corner of the altar. So if we can just try and uh, draw a picture of, of the altar, square altar, that we find in the tabernacle, it had a horn at the four sides, the four corners. 
And in Hebrew, I've told, I've told you, we have been taught that we find the Yud, Hey, Vo, Hey, the name at the four corners, because his name is a four corner name. In Hebrew, that is what it stands, the Tetragrammatum name. So every time that you and I call on his name and acknowledge him in the midst, he, he, the yut or the hay or the vo or the second day is developed and grows between our eyes. His name grows. So the horn talks about his name, talks about his character. So as praat van die hooring, praat ons van die, dat in Hebrews verwees dit na Alef, dat verwees na die hoorings van die altaar. And what do we do at the altar? Because we want to know how to grow that horn. So as we grow, as we acknowledge Him as the sovereign one, Alef in our midst, our horn grows. What happens at the altar? As we repent, the horn grows. Because we repent at the altar. As we bring our whole burnt offerings, yourself, and we, you and I surrender in our circumstances that is deeper than we can think where God is going with us, but we surrender before Him. The horn grows. His name grows. So that's how the horn is grown. I don't know how Christians can continue serving Him if the message that they get in the preaching is not about you've repented, you don't need to repent now anymore, you're complete and whatever, and uh, oh, all the rubbish. Right. What is this word horn? That word horn is the word, this word, keren. Now, spirit to hear to you uh, in, in Hebrew. Let me just see here where and I write it down. If I can spell it to you in, first in English. Then I'll spell it to you in Hebrew. Kof. Uh, uh, Resh. <coughs> and then the Nun. Kof. Kof, the Resh, and the Nun. Well, the Nun. Right. <laughs> okay. So we learn how this horn, because the horn is the most important weapon that a portion of weaponry that the Lord reveals here. He talks about the enemy. He says, your enemy is my enemy. My enemy is your enemy. Your enemy is mine. Mine is yours. He says, all right. Then he continues. He says, but, 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 there's a horn. The, he says, but my horn shall thou exalt. Because you see, the horn is grown that because you acknowledge that you stand under the government of Aleph. So Aleph is the one that directs your horn. He controls the horn. He knows when to exalt and to lift the horn against the enemy. You and I do not know when. But he says here, My horn shalt thou exalt. Like the horn of a unicorn. He says, what I must do is, I must just repent. As we said, surrender. Acknowledge Him in the midst of your circumstances. And as you do that, the horn grows. And He is the owner of that horn because it's His name. And He will know when to exalt that horn. When to lift up that horn. When the enemy comes. Uh, and He says... So we need the horn. Let me just write it down here. And what else do we need? According to the scripture there. Oil? What oil? Fresh oil. Right. Fresh oil. 
Now remember, we have talked here, and the word here talks about my home. So I mean, you grow His name. His name grows in your life. It's your home. Shane grows His horn in her life as she surrenders and repents and sees Him in the midst of her circumstances. Okay? Then he says there, so it's, it's personalized. It's one. Then he says there, and I shall be anointed with fresh oil. So I mean, he, he's going to give you fresh oil. Fresh? Why fresh? Because every battle is new. The, battle, the, the enemy comes in different ways, different forms, from different sides. What he does, he, he controls the horn so that you can be safe. And you need a new anointing of His Spirit to be able to stand and to have victory in this battle. Can anybody say amen? So you, you see there that once again the Holy Spirit, the oil, is personalized again. So the worm is persuaded, the eye shall be anointed with fresh oil is persoonlik. So elke dag het ons vars olie nodig. So, alright, that's important. So we have fresh oil, specific oil, for specific circumstances. Then in verse 11, let's continue there, he says, the psalm writer now writes, uh, says, now, mine eye also shall see my desire on my enemies and my ears shall hear my, uh, uh, my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. Sure. Six times there in the English. Six times very personalized. Very, very personalized. How many times do we find Christians that they are, they've been destroyed by the enemy, they come for help, and you tell them this is uh, how you do it, you must have a personal, fresh, new personal anointing of the Spirit of God. You must have understanding of the Word so that you can grow the horn. God is in the midst and He's sovereign. Yes, but, 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 but. If you still but, and you don't realize what the Word of God's saying, you will not survive this war Amen. and this battle. Amen. It is very personalized. As you've just seen, mine eye, your eye, needs to see. And that word I, that word I, so we see what, what, what vision is he talking about in verse, uh, verse, verse 11. That word I is spelled with I-N, with a yut, and with a nun. All right. So what affects our eyes? So let's see what consists our eyes of. If we look at the Hebrew writing, we get more information. Zayen is spelled with a Zayen, which talks about a truth, the truth that is absolute, that we find in the Bible, that never suits our doctrine, but we need to change our doctrine to his doctrine. Zayen, emet, worth, more of his spirit. A yud, which talks about God's hand, God's presence, and God's spirit. It actually talks about uh, metaphysics. God is present, but we don't see him. So that type of sight. You will not see God physically. And with a noon, now the noon in Hebrew, in, in biblical Hebrew, consists out of, this is the end, the, the end, the noon, uh, first of all, uh, looks like this, in the, in the middle and the beginning of a word, and at the end of the word, it looks like this. But out of what does a noon stand, uh, uh, consist of? It consists out of a zayen, but it's a zayen that is bent. What does it mean? 
It means people, the Bible is fantastic. Amen. The Bible, and if we get to the original language that God has spoken in, it is absolutely mind blowing. Because what does the noon say? He talks about faithfulness. He talks about me. I need, I need to humble myself under the truth. That's what the, it means in Hebrew. I, so truth is not there for me to say, I know the truth. The truth is this and the truth is that. Because if I do it that way, I'm not speaking truth. If I speak about the truth and I do it this way, and I exalt the truth and the only thing you see is truth, that is Zayat. Amen. So even in the alphabet, it's built in. You don't walk around saying, I've got the truth. I know what emet is, I know what this is, I know what that is. Because if you do that, you've already missed it. Amen. So truth is, the noon is, being faithful in bending my knees under the truth. That will cause me to walk upright. In the end of it. All right? Because that's how this word is spelt. The word is spelt with that noon at the end. Okay. So, we are talking about sight. What is sight? Sight, you need the truth. You need Zayen truth. Zayen means, it's the same word for bread, and the same word for a sharp weapon. To keep your bread, you need a weapon. To get bread, you need a weapon. Both ways. So, if you study and are given the truth, and you allow the Spirit of God to grow and enlarge in you, and you call upon and say, Lord, enlarge your spirit in me. I need more of your spirit. It affects your eyesight. And you will start seeing the unseen, the invisible God. His hand in your midst. And you will walk with the truth, but in humility. Lifting up the truth. That is somebody that sees. That's when he says, that's when he says, mine eye, shall see my desire. My desire on my enemies. Because my desire on my enemies must be the same. If this is eyesight, my desire will be the same, then my desire on my enemies will be the same than God's desire on my enemies. This. And I also shall see my desire on my enemies, and mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. They shall hear. I will know what the enemy says. I will hear it, but I will hear it through eyes really seen and through the truth. What are these enemies? What are these enemies? The British, that is just... just Mentioned, the kvelaks, as ek gesê in Afrikaans, die redeloose, onmenselike een binnen in jou. Jy sal hoor hoe praat hulle in jou binnenste. Redeloos, reneer nie volgens die waarheid en Godse souvereiniteit nie. Deelik sal jy het hoor. The fool, the fool that says God is not in this. God is nie in hierdie saak nie. Die duivel is jou, weer ja, Die duivel is hier, en die antichrist is hier, en dit is hier, en dit is hier, en dit is hier. Maar you know what? Why don't you, why don't you identify the sovereign one? Why all the little Pekingese? All the little ones? Why acknowledge them in your circumstances? Why don't you acknowledge the sovereign one? Okay? And then the wicked, as he said, is the moral, moral, morally wrong, the, the breaker of the truth in your own life, and other people breaking the truth through their doctrine that changes the truth. They form part of the wicked. That is what it means in Hebrew. And the works of iniquity means those that twist the truth to suit them. Do we find it a lot in the church world? Yes, we find it a lot. Truth has been changed and twisted. Workers of iniquity is busy in the church world. 
They are the enemies. You will hear them. But you will have him governing your own and giving you a fresh anointing. Okay. Let's have a look at this horn. We haven't even, we said how to get it. But let's look more. The Bible expounds the truth so much that you and I don't need to wonder what it's about. We don't need to take anything of our own doctrine to add. Kom ons kyk wat hierdie worm bestaan. Bestaan die worm. Nee, as het nog gesê, dit is die worm wat die woord van praat. Dit is sy jood, hy wil hy wat in ons levens ontwikkel. Wanneer ons repent en ons self oorgee en om in die midde, in die middel van alles raak sien. Ok, verder kan ons sê, because when he kisses me, when he touches me with his presence, when I surrender myself at his altar, he separates me. He puts me aside. And as he puts me aside, and because he has touched me, and because I have a relationship with him, where he touches me, sorry, uh, frequently, it changes my reasoning. So that I can, my reasoning, in my reasoning, I can obey him. And be faithful. Be faithful to him. If that is the components of my relationship with him, he will grow his horn. And you know what this horn means? It means ivory. An ivory horn, and actually talks about the tusks of an elephant. So this horn talks about, in the Hebrew it says, it talks about aggressive and offenses, offensive power. So you can defend, and you can push, and, de and defend, and be offensive. God works that character in you. So you don't read a book about spiritual warfare. Do, do number one, two, three. When you do this and then you say, all right, number one, I do this. Number two, I do this. The spirit world goes, ah. <laughs> look at this fool. Because spiritual warfare is not, by reading, is not reading a book. It's not spiritual warfare. Knowing A, B, C, D, and E. Spiritual warfare is doing, growing, living, being. So a book on spiritual warfare won't help you. The book of life, carrying the t-shirt. That is what spiritual warfare is about. People writing about spiritual warfare. I mean, if I read about the, the war on the border, the war against communism, the military war against communism. I read about it. I could know everything about it. I buy myself a machine gun, bullets, hand grenades, a few mines, landmines, personal mines. Get myself a big, nice truck. And I drive up Africa. I'm going to fight communism now with my book next to me. All right. Walk run into the first. What's it means for another law? Right in the first ambush, write my book, chook, open my book, page number three, you'll be dead. You'll not be able to fight that war, you're not going to last anyway, two seconds. Because the enemy is going to laugh their heads off. And they'll be glad to put your head in the front of their engine cap. Tie it up there to show everybody how big fool came in here. If you don't do the training and you take care and you develop skills, the skill is not something you read about, it's something you practice, something you do, something you, you, you get better in, knowing how to handle it. Fortunately, God says He deals with the horn. He gives the fresh anointing. But I must do this. I must come into his presence.
on a constant basis. Allow him to touch me. Allow him to kiss me. So that he can separate me, put me aside. So that my reasoning can change. So that I can be faithful. Because faithfulness in the, in the, in the fiery battle is what it's all about. If your friend jumps up during a battle fight and runs, <laughs> dead. Faithfulness is part of the battle. Armory. The noon that we are talking about. Right. So here he talks about this horn, verse 10, but, but my horn shall exalt uh, my, my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn I shall be anointed with fresh oil mine eyes shall see my desire of my enemies and my ears shall hear my, my desire of the wicked that rise against me verse 12 the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree and he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon wonderful Wonderful. Of whom are we talking now in verse, verse 12? The righteous. We did some study some while ago. What is the righteous in Hebrew? Tadi. That's right. Uh, Tzadik, Tzadi, verbuigings daarvan, ok. The root word we said is spelled. Right? Tzadik? Uh, Dalet, that's right. And a kof. That was the root word. Right, so who is the tzaddik? Let's have a look. The tzaddik is spelled with the tzaddik. What does a tzaddik consist of? In Hebrew, I'm just, we're just saying Hebrew. It consists out of a zayen. But a zayen, which is a weapon, once again the truth. But now we see even more the knees are bent. Remember with the noon, we said... The, the knees bent there. The rabbis say, now why does God bring in a second time that the knee must be bent? They say, because you can never be humble enough. You can never go down enough. So God reminds us, when He talks about tzaddik, He says, it's those that bend their knee before and under the truth, even in a greater way than at noon. That is anointed with God's Spirit. So tzaddik is those that has got the, spirit, the truth they made, that God is sovereign. And it's not them that, uh, that takes the, 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 the glamour, the glory. They bend so much that they lift up the truth and the truth gets the glory in their life. And with the uh, uh, door, the dalet, they acknowledge their poverty. That's right. It talks about, remember, I drew a little man, a man standing with his arms begging, hands begging like that. Poverty, poor, small. Why? Because the truth and the Spirit of God comes to that one that knows he's small, that knows that he's broken, that knows that he's weak. So if you feel weak in your circumstances, fantastic. Wonderlijk. Yes, klein. Yes, arm. Yes, arm zalig. Je kan niks veranderen in jezelf of in je omstandigheden. Wonderlijk. Maar wat je moet doen is, leg die waarheid op. Zij hen. Buig onder die waarheid. Niet onder je omstandigheden, nie. onder die waarheid. Vraag die Heer is een geest om je te bekrachtig. And in doing that, he is... Uh, well, as the Kof talks about, separation, holiness, putting you aside for a special purpose 
of revealing His name to His creation and to His creatures. So, it is first of all those that we are talking about here. Right. So, is there anybody here that qualifies? Nobody. So, I'm asking. You can't, you can't sleep here. Is there anybody that qualifies? Romans 5 verse 1 says, By faith, being made righteous, being justified by His blood. I thought you remember the message of then of the tzaddik. So I'm asking once again, who is tzaddik or tzaddi? Put up your hand. Right. Right. So we're talking about, the Bible is talking here about us. He says, the righteous shall flourish. They shall flourish. We'll see just now that they, oh, all right, let me just do this. Um, let's read the, first, the last four verses. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no un unrighteousness in him. Right. Thank you. So let's go back then to verse, verse 12. The righteous shall flourish. We read there in verse, um, verse 14, the righteous shall as well be fat. And we read further on, they shall grow. And we read further on that they shall have fruit. That is you and me. He says, he says here, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. Like the palm tree. Here we have a palm tree. I'm definitely not, I can't really draw pictures really. I'm not an artist, but there's a palm tree. What palm tree does the Bible talk about there? Hebrew says, they talk, the Bible talks there about the date palm. Dad Oboom. It talks about, so it, when he talks about the palm tree, he talks about the date palm, so he talks about dates. Fruit. Fruit. Right, we'll come back to the date tree now. And further on, he says, so he talks about fruit. Then he says, the righteous is like a cedar tree. A cedar tree, the word cedar means it's got roots. A very good root system. An extended root system. That is well, I have what the word cedar means, an extended root system. So, the righteous has got a double character, one that carries, carries fruit, and one whose roots is very well established. Did you know sitting in this church actually is dangerous? Because of a tree outside here. This big tree on the corner here, when you go out, it's this thick. It's a saram. It's a uitiem sa boom. Daai saram. Daai saram. Het a baie swak wortelstelsel. When we bought those trees here at the back that we planted there, uh, the guy that knows trees, I asked him, this saram, what type of root system he has? He says, a very shallow root system. But I said, look how beautiful it is. It looks like, the, sounds like the church world now. Look how beautiful it is. It's a nice big, big tree. It's green. It impresses me. But it's dangerous. He says to me, if there comes a storm and a wind, and there uh, it starts blowing against that tree, that tree might not stand. I've, we have seen it all among Christians. 
that it looks so beautiful on the top, the leaves, everything. Right. When you talk about the seed, that you don't see fruit. So we just see the leaves in the general, general, I'm generalizing, leaves in the church world, leaves, big trees. But the moment the storms come and the rains come and they blow against those trees, you see trees, trees being uprooted. We see Christians being uprooted because it all looked, looked well and fine. But their root system was not that of a cedar. What makes a cedar a cedar, what the word cedar means, it means a root system. Not in own doctrines, but in the truth. By faith, fixed and extended in the truth. That makes a, a, a cedar tree a cedar. Are you tired? Should I end? Let me continue. Right. We're going back. We're coming back there. Just trying to, to do bits by bits. Flourish. When it says, what flourishes? The righteous. And what tree flourishes? The palm tree. Flourishes and just now we'll see is fat. Now, when is, when is the righteous flourishing? What does that word flourish mean? Let me spell it to you. Yeah, it must be fed. Yes. When it is fed, yes, that's right. Then it flourishes. Yes, that's true. But it's, it is fed from the root system of the cedar. What we actually should do, we should draw a palm with extended roots. The roots is cedar and the fruit is, and the tree is uh, date, date palm. Okay, so yes, definitely, fed, very important. But let's, let me spell the word uh, flourish to you in Hebrew. First in English, it's P R H. All right, spelled that way in the dictionary, it's spelled that way in the, in the English. And if we spell it in, in the Hebrew, it is a pe. All right, it is a resh. And it is a chet. Or a he, or do you say actually he? How do you pronounce it? Let me write it in Hebrew for you first. All right, so it is a... He is a resh, and the chet, or the, I say chet, maybe it's wrong, wrongly pronounced, that way. How would you pronounce it, Afshan? Part means flourish, flourish. So when does it, when he says, the date will flourish. What say in Afrikaans? What's the word that they have break there? Uh, Shanae? Verse 12, no. Yeah, yeah, for school with you. And the, and the grijse ouderom, no, a bit further, where I've been further talking. Right, donkey. All right, that word flourish. So when do you and I flourish? Yes, when we extend our roots, definitely, and those roots can only extend when you get fed. Ask me, I've got a big vegetable garden, we've been feeding from there for 35 three years, got our own fruit garden, orchard, ask me, I've got the t-shirt. Right. If you need a tree to extend its roots, you need to properly feed it and water it. Christians, do you hear? We need proper feeding. Yes, yes. Yes, we need water and we need nutrition. We need proper soil. We can see just now, he gives us there, he gives us everything. He says they must be planted in the house of God. And we'll see what the house of God means because it doesn't mean this church. 
or the next church or the next organization or the next denomination. doesn't mean that. Fortunately, I'm very glad it doesn't mean that at all. Okay, so, yes, we're going to get to the root system what it means, what type of nourishment. Flourish, fl to flourish, when we flourish and when the tzaddik flourishes and the fruit flourishes, it affects your mouth. It affects our mouth. Because in front of the mouth, what will you find? What does this pear? How do you pronounce it? Pear. How out of uh, in the Hebrew, how, what does it consist of? It consists out of a bed and it consists out of a chet, a, a cuff. So what does it say? It says, My mouth must become my mouth. When will I flourish? When my mouth becomes the house of truth. When truth becomes gemakkelijk, when die waarheid, die waarheid, wat ons nou gedefinieer, gemakkelijk is in jou mond. And further, it is his works. He works it in us. Alright. And, what else? It's got a yut in front of it. It means God's spirit guards over your mouth. So that whatever truth is in your mouth, it doesn't just come out. People that walk around with every time exposing the truth that they have about the Word of God, we not, that's not flourish. Flourish means when it's under the control of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God controls the truth that you've been fed and the proof, truth that has become, that has found home in your mouth. If that happens, your reasoning is affected. You start reasoning according to the word. That is to flourish. How do you pronounce this uh, the, uh, option, this letter? Hit. Ch. The ch consists out of two zayens. Two zayens. Yeah, they are connected so it's just so when the Bible says double zayen zayen it means most of geen spieling is dit moet die waarheid wees so flourish means when the truth is established and becomes the fence in your life it brings yes abundant life we asked, my wife is helping me to compile a nice big poster of the Hebrew, the ancient, the biblical Hebrew, the numerical value and everything so that we can have it laminated big so that we can put it up here so that you can see it more often with a, just a few, maybe an extra meaning of the word of the letter, of the word of the letter, of the letter of the word. And you will see the ch, the ch, means abundance, flourish, abundance, that's what this means, abundant in truth, amen, zayen, right, flourish, the date tree flourishes, it means the fruit that comes from your lips is sweet, because that is dates, that is a date, it is sweet, And it is fat. You'll see there. Um, yeah, verse 14. Fat. Yeah. I'll, say, I'll, I'll spell the word fat to you just now. I've written, I don't know where, somewhere. See where I'll find it. Right. So, uh, that is the word flourish. So what is a date tree? What is the fruits of a Christian? Of Sadi. Sadiq. What is the fruit? What is a date tree? A date grows in a hot climate. So if it's hot around you, if it becomes very hot around you, they actually say, the date does, does the best in the valley 
at the Dead Sea. Very, it's very hot. So, Marilanki, as it warm is on you, as it so that here the dadels, boom can not grow, any dadels can ripe can make, there are ripe, soot dadels on you. A day three further on, uh, they say, that's what the biblical Bible dictionary says, it leaves. Uh, its leaves are used symbolically for victory. So what do we see from a date, waving from a date tree? Victory. Victory. Mm. Victory. Okay. Where do we find dates, date trees? They say they find, we find dates, date trees only at oasis. Oasis, water oasis, or well watered places. See, so if I look at the tzaddik, tzaddik, I know that she stands in a well watered place because a date doesn't grow in any other place. By the Lord's grace and the mercy, you will find an oasis and water here. Amen. Okay. Dates further on were highly valued as food and nutrition. So it's not like when, other, when Christians share the fruits, the sweetness of their life, that people die. As of the sea, not in Christ. Of good what gedeel wordt, that the kastig die waarheid is, and kastig die woord is, and is doctrine van die woord, maar die skuim kom by die mens in mond uit, and the oor draai om. En is duidelijk dat het enige gif is van je floreer nie, groei nie, groei nie, groei nie. Sien nie victory nie. Sien nie soetheid van die lippe afkom nie. Really? Alright. Dates you can eat fresh. Dates you can eat dried. They dried dates. They take dates and they put it into, uh, they, they press it into cakes so it can be stored and port, be, be portable. Uh, what else can I say about dates? They give you energy. So if you talk to a date tree and a date tree shares with you fruit from a her, from her root, a cedar root system, it will bring life, it will bring fire, it will bring excitement. What does constipation talk about? The below things. Now, is it? All right. If you eat dates, you'll be cleansed. You'll be detoxified. You will not have a problem. Is any problem in for stop the wees? Is a gereeld gaan. Get rid of the nonsense and the toxins and everything. So it will keep you detoxified. And it will detoxify you. So I'm praying this morning that you eat a lot of dates. I don't want to bury you under the dates. I just want to give you one or two dates to eat. Right. Dates, they say, palms are a symbol both of beauty and prosperity. And remember, a few places in the Bible, it talks about the 70 date trees at some oasis. 70, 70. I've mentioned something about numerics just now. The numeric value of the word ayen is 70. Your vision, your eyes. So eating dates does something to your eyesight. It affects your eyesight. Dates was used to decorate uh, for decoration in the temple. Dates were used in construction of uh, the Luofhuttefees. Luofhuttefees. Uh, What's that in English? Feast of Tabernacles. Date leaves was used, reminding them it was a symbol for them of freedom from slavery. 
So a day tree should be a, remember, a reminding of, I mean, I'm set free from Egypt, from the house of slavery of sin. All right. Okay. And we can continue to talk about dates. We're supposed to be the fruit as a result of us being tadi or tadik. How is this word palm date spelt? It's spelt in English T M R. If you do it that way around, so I mean can see. T M R. It is spelt tough. Mem and Resh. Is that right? Yes. So it's Taf. Mem. Resh. That's how this palm is spelt. Can you say something? Yes. All right. So. What are the characteristics of a palm? A palm definitely follows the way of the cross. The crucified way, the way of the cross. Meaning, laying down self, laying down selfishness. Lifting up the truth. A palm further on allows the word and studies the word so the word is revealed and God is revealed greater and greater and more and more to you and me and brings uh, order to the chaos and it, it, it judges me and it, it judges the self in me so that my reasoning can change. You see, reasoning is at the end of the Hebrew alphabet, not at the beginning. Because our reasoning, we need all of the principles of the doctrines of the alphabet to change our reasoning. So we need that to be a palm tree to operate in our lives. All right, he says, uh, she bears fruit and she flourishes and she's fat like a date tree, a date palm. And then she says, the word says there that the, uh, the tzaddik, it's not wrong when I say she, which is we, she, she has got a root system, like a cedar. Now, how do we spell the word cedar? In English, red. The root, spelled in English. Of course, then, in Hebrew, it is spelled with a resh. Now, Ayen, right, in the, in the Hebrew, Biblical Hebrew, it is spelled with this Ayen. Can you pronounce it, I mean? Re? Rezen. Re. Reza. Right, thank you very much. All the Imams from the Islamic religion have got the name of God. Okay. But then, Reza, almost everything in order. Right. Right, so what characteristic does this true, this tree, this Sedar, have. What is the characteristic of a Christian with Sedar, with Sedar, Wortelstelsel? Eerstens, say reasoning, as volgens die zayen, die waarheid. Punt. Hierdie week, Ik moet Heinrich een paar keer gepraat. 
en in een worsteling wat hij het moet, iemand wat oor sy pad gekom het, mens wat oor sy pad gekom het, en wat skrikwekkend is, en is, het is mense wat hier Jesus belei, wat skrikwekkend is, is dat die oomlik as jy begin kyk na die wortelstelsel, dan is die reasoning glad nie volgens die waarheid nie. Ja, volgens doktrine, volgens alle doktrine, maar een groot deel van hulle doktrine is, hulle doktrine is nie die Heerese doktrine. Met ander woorde, jy krij hierdie boom, met die klein wortelstelsels nie. Met ander woorde, jy krij hierdie christene, met een mooi boom, baie loof, nee, baie loof, het beteken blare, indrukwekkend, maar as die winde begin blaas, en die storms kom aan die christene, dan wortel het hulle so. Die een na die ander. Die probleem le hier. Reasoning according to the Zion, the emet, true. Dis wat die probleem le. Want hier die sederboom wortelstelsel vorm die wortelstelsel van die palm van die palm, so te sê, en verduidelik hem nou, ok, so a cedar tree, and a palm tree is one, the palm tree can survive, because it's got cedar tree roots, can survive the winds, and the storms, and the rains, and the uh, things that come to uproot the trees, and push over the trees, and blow over the trees, it can survive in droughts, and in famines, Because the date stands at the water source, at the oasis, it's got this root system to get all the nourishment, it's got everything, it's got fruit for, to feed itself, to feed others, God feeds from it, the word says the father is the husbandman, he eats of the fruit. You eat from it, Those, the travelers that pass by eat from it, the hungry eat from it, the famished eat from it, Nou, amen. The Bible is not finished. It says here, the righteous flourish like the palm tree shall grow like cedars in Lebanon. The cedars like, like, remember, like, like cedars in Lebanon. What does Lebanon, Lebanon speak of? Lebanon is spelt in the roots, Lebanon, 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 is spelt, this is how the dictionary gives it, it is spelt, ach, Lamet, Bet, in, in, in English, L-A-B-E. And, they say, it takes you to Lamet, Bet, Bet. On purpose I said, I didn't say the word, because it's words that you know. What is Lebanon? Lebanon the roots of Lebanon is labe, L-A-B-E. Your reasoning, your thinking, your meditations, your inner heart. And it goes further, the same word goes further, it says, it goes further than that. It goes deeper than that. It goes to your love, the heart where your loves, your sentiments, your tradition, your loves lie. All right, so it speaks. Lebanon speaks about your reasoning, about your thinking, about your meditation, about your loves, your passions, your uh, sentiments, your essence of your being. The 
essence of your being. That's right. It talks about the essence of your being. That's why it talks about lamet. Lamet. It talks about purpose. It talks about, when it, it talks about the, it, it's in the middle of the alphabet. It's many times written most taller than all the other letters, many times, because God is accent, accentuating how important teaching is. Teaching. It talks about teaching. To be taught in the Word of God. To be taught so that the teaching of the Torah becomes your house in which you live. So in your innermost being, the way that you think, the way that you are, is according to the Torah. That forms Lebanon. And the seed that grows in that. A seed that doesn't grow in anything else. Is dit nie, is dit nie asom rooming? Wat die Heere vir ons leer, uit sy woord het. Janai, Reddersburg, is nie Reddersburg sonder dit nie. In die ware sin van die woord. Reddersburg means the place, the city, where salvation is. Now here we talking about the real Reddersburg, the city where salvation is. The city lies inside of it. The way you and I reason and think, it must be according to the principles by which God operates and God works. And we cannot call something Torah if it's not Torah. You can call it, and I can call it Torah, and many times we as Christians do. We do call certain principles and doctrines, we say it's God's principles, but it's not. It will have a different character, it will, it will bring different fruit. It will not bring dates. Amen. Right. Right. Then he says there in verse 13, he just carries on, and he says there in verse 13, those, talking about the righteous, okay, verse 13, those that be planted in the house of the Lord. Now here we've already learned where to be planted, but God just continues. He makes sure that we get, that we get um, the answer, that we get what, it, what he's talking about. Those that be planted in the house of God. I read some commentaries. I went on the internet. I mean, it doesn't matter which, which denomination explains that verse. It means that you must stay in their denomination. You must come to their church. You must come to church. Or whatever the church's name is. Whether it's Kadesh, or whether it's Kadush, or whether it's just Kadom, or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, just stay. No. By being here, doesn't mean that you are planted in the house of the Lord. We can sit here and not be planted in the house of God if we know what it means to be planted in the house of God. You can be buried in the house of God or planted. It will not help you and me. We can sleep here in this, in this house. It will not help us. You can come to church every Sunday and every Tuesday. It will not help you and me. Uh, you can come to this church anytime the door opens. You will not flourish because you do that, because you do just that, by coming. What I can tell you is, here's an oasis, you will find water here, you will see palm trees standing here, and you will find trees with cedar roots developing. Yes, that you will find. But what, in whose house are we talking about? He says, the house of God not a house of a specific denomination or a specific church or group or Bible study group. He says in verse 13, those, talking about the cedars and the palm trees, those that be planted in the house of God. Let me read you from the living Bible. I'm, I'm not, I won't say I'm nearly finished. I'm on my way. Verse 12. They will steady, steady you with their... Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Different. 
But the godly shall flourish like palm trees and grow tall as the cedars of Lebanon, for they are transplanted into the Lord's own garden and are under the personal care. You see, they're quite, quite right here. The house of God. The house of God. House. How does this word house, how is it spelt? How is this word house spelt? In English, it is spelled that way. Bait. Or bit. Bait. I'm just going to write the root word to you. Of course, it will be bad. And of course, it will then be tough. Right. Right. In biblical Hebrew, it is bad and tough. Yes. Right. What does the, what the, what does the tough mean? The tough means signature. God's signature. God's mark. So what is the mark or the signature by which this family, because Beth talks about the family as well, doesn't only talk about the house or the tent, it talks about the family. So what, how is this family acknowledged or, or uh, how is this family identified? It's identified by the mark of the father of that family, which is the cross. Can you say yeah? yeah. We must get loud. We must get loud. Are you staying in that house? House means habit. It means your house of habit. What habitually, the way of thinking inside of you. How are you restricting yourself? Are you restricting yourself and saying, no, I'm thinking this way about this matter. No, I must think this way. My father of the house in which I live wants me to think this way. How does he think? He thinks Torah. He thinks Emet. He thinks Zayen. That's how I must think. We are putting a mark on ourselves. We are putting a mark on ourselves. Yes, the Antichrist is going, doing these experiments, scientific experiences, how to get the mark of the Antichrist into your forehead. And your, the, it's so far they can actually do it any time now. But meanwhile, back at the ranch, back at the house of Yeshua Moshiach, he says, who wants to be in my, in my house? Let me see how you think. Oh, yes. You say you think this way, but the mark that I see on you is the cross. Let me see how you think. I see the cross. Let me see how you think. The father of your house is definitely God. I see the mark. I see the mark on your head the father's mark the tzaddik is planted in that type of thinking we just saw here the tzaddik is planted in that type of thinking that's how the cedar root, the cedar finds its roots and that's how the palm tree produces dates because they are planted in the father's house not in a specific group like Kadesh, not in a specific denomination, not because of a specific structure or doctrine, singing specific songs, giving a specific teaching, knowing little, a little bit of the Hebrew, not because of that. What is going on inside of you, that's what determines. What can you benevolent on, what like you do in your benevolent? And verse 14, I was smiling when I re read this. He says, they, talking about tzaddik, talking about the date and the palm tree, they, the, the cedar tree, they shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Because people, uh, uh, Claudius not here today, every now and then he would say to me, will you continue, when you get older, will you continue with the, bio, with the studies? 
What else should I do? If I don't do that, I will die. So as long as God says, continue. There is someone that wants it. As long as there is someone that wants it, if there is no one that wants it, continue. Into your old age, you and me, into our old age, we need to shoot roots downward, extend our cedar root system. We need to grow up, because the cedar grows up, away from this life, and producing fruit. Let me just stop there. I went over time, I know. I'm not saying, I'm sorry. So what we're trying to do is we're trying sometimes to study subjects, specific subjects. Sometimes we try to take a certain piece of portion of scripture and change it that way. Let us just pray and close in prayer. Lord Jehovah Yeshua Moshiach You are the father of the house. El Bethel God of the house of God. To you we bow. We acknowledge you in our presence. We ask you, El Beth El, help us. Help me. Help every one of us, Lord, to return to the Father's house in every matter of our life. As life develops, as our life develops, as our programs change, let us return to the Father's house in our thinking. As we sit at your table, that we will humble ourselves, lift up your truth, that your truth, Lord, may be visible and not us. You can work it. You know how to do it. It is your kingdom, Lord. Amen.